Welcome everyone to TechCraft, this is Rob. Today's video is part six, the final part of my beginner's guide to series shortcuts. In today's video, we'll be looking at seven concrete tips and techniques that will make you a better shortcut creator and will help you build shortcuts that are easier to maintain and will last for a long, long time. Let's go. So I focus specifically on techniques that are simple and easy to understand that will lead to good design and well-structured shortcuts rather than fancy tips that might look clever but don't have the same long-term impact. If you haven't watched the first five parts of this series, make sure you check those out up above just to catch up on where we're up to. Otherwise, let's dive straight in. So whenever you see portrayals of coding or development work on them in the movies, you often see someone who knows every line of code in advance and they're just cranking out code after code after code and never once do they stop to try and find out what's possible or whatever. That's not really my experience. Typically, I spend quite a bit of time reading documentation, browsing Google, trying to find out what code already exists, what I can build on and what I can improve on. I think that's much more indicative of the real world coding. And in the shortcuts context, what that means is knowing what actions are available to you, knowing what you can build on, knowing what you don't need to rebuild so that you can deliver your solution as fast as possible. So my first technique or tip, if you will, is to spend as much time as you can browsing the actions on your iPad or on your iPhone to understand what is available to you. Now, the where I, I recommend starting is with these seven characters. Uh, so where I recommend starting is with these seven categories here, the favorite scripting media, location, document sharing, and the web, and just browse through them. So where I recommend starting is with these six categories here, scripting media, location, document sharing, and web, and then just browse through them, read the documentation for each action, and don't just do that, but when you see one that you're not sure about, drag it onto the canvas here and actually try building a shortcut with that. And let me give you an example of why I think that is important. If I... Scroll down to this one here, say get network details and bring that over. Yes, the, in the documentation says get information about the currently connected networks. Okay, great. But it doesn't tell me what I can do until I actually come in here and say, okay, well, I can do mobile data stuff. Oh, I can get the network provider name. This is great. I can press play and get that. I can get the radio technology. These are interesting things that you don't really know about until you dive in and actually see what the actions do. And you can actually see that that one didn't work the way you expected to. So that's another thing that you might want to know when you're trying these shortcuts out and trying to build shortcuts is what actions are available and what can I do with them? Now, the aim here is absolutely not to try and build an exhaustive understanding of every single action that you have committed to rote memory. Really, it's to build a broad appreciation of what is available so that then when you have an idea, you think, hey, actually, I know how to do that because I've seen these three actions that I could stitch together. Or moreover, sometimes just seeing like, oh, these two actions are interesting, I could stitch them together, would give you the idea for a new shortcut. So absolutely, hands down, the best investment of time you can make to becoming a good shortcut creator is just browsing through all the actions and playing with them. So one action we haven't actually seen yet in the uh, series is this comment action. And I say action, it's not really an action, it doesn't actually do anything. It just gives you a place where you can write some descriptive text into your uh, shortcut. Now, where would you use this? Well, there's a whole bunch of places you would use it. Firstly, I think if you're going to be sharing your shortcuts with the wider community, like we saw back in part five, then it can be quite handy as the first thing you do in your shortcut, just to write an explanation of what the shortcut does, briefly how it works, maybe how to get in contact if you need support, that kind of thing. It's just a nice place to have a, a rough description of what the shortcut does and how it does it. So that's just one place you might use the uh, the comments. Another place is in somewhere like this where we've got this kind of complex logic. We've got a loop, we've got some if statements. And what we might want to do is just drag a comment in and briefly explain what is happening. So I can put that here. And I will say if the width is greater than the height, then resize along the width, otherwise along the height. And that's just a little snippet to say what we're doing. And obviously the code kind of does say that, but if you've got a lot of these nested uh, elements, like nested ifs and nested loops, it can get quite confusing. And these comments not only delimit the block almost, but they just describe what's happening. The other thing that I think is really interesting here is that you can use comments to capture actions that you need to do later on. Now these are commonly called to-do comments in the coding world, and they often start with the word to-do at the beginning. 
And one thing we might want to do that for here is what happens if the target size of this resize operation, which is this pixels thing here, is actually already bigger than the image. Maybe we don't want to resize it at all. So what I'd perhaps like to do is just drag in another comment and say to do handle small images. And then I know, small images, and then I know later on that I can come back and say, okay, I've got some more work to do here. And then when I've done it, I can just delete that comment and say, right, okay, that's fine now. So correct usage of comments is one of the hardest things I've ever encountered in development. Too many comments and the code starts to get hidden and often the comments get out of date. Um, and it's the worst thing than no comments is comments that say something different than the actual code says, or in this case, if we had this saying something different than what these actions said, that's kind of confusing to the, the user or the reader. So I definitely recommend erring on the side of fewer comments rather than more, but definitely to-do comments are very useful and complex logic explanation is very, very useful in a comment. There are some techniques of good design that we can use that obviate the need for comments in many cases. So let's take a look at those examples right now. So the first example I actually have is right here in the same bulk resize shortcut, which is to use explicit variables. Now, we could easily get rid of this variable here and stitch together later on this, so we could change this, uh, click clear, come into here, select magic variable, pull in this. But this gets really messy quite quickly, the bigger the shortcut gets, and it has a couple of major downsides. First of all, I don't think it's very clear. I think it's a lot clearer if this actually just points to a variable that we've given a clear name to. In particular, if I had another variable holding photos, when you've got multiple magic variables of the same type, it gets super confusing. So giving them an explicit name that you can refer to is really, really useful in just making the shortcut more readable. And often you can get rid of a comment by having a well-named variable. So another major benefit to explicit variables is being able to change where those values come from later on. And as an example, let me, let me show you this. We've got a variable here called pixels, and it's actually used twice, once here and once here. Now, if these both refer to the magic variable, and I changed where this came from, maybe it doesn't come from a user interface action, it instead comes from some kind of configuration or something, then I have to go here and change this twice. As it is, all I do is just change where the value of pixels comes from. So not not repeating yourself is a really important thing and having a single place where a value is defined and set in a name is really, really useful. So my recommendation is wherever possible for anything but the simplest of shortcuts, you should use explicit variables. So another way of improving the structure of your comments is to actually decompose a larger shortcut into smaller shortcuts. That is to split something that's got maybe 100 actions into five shortcuts of 20 actions or something similar. And there's a huge number of benefits to that, but let's just see roughly how it works. So this is a shortcut that I made on an episode way back that I'll link above. And what you see here is that we've got an action called run shortcut that runs another shortcut. And we have that a few times here. We have extract colors, make title banner, run base 64 encode, those kind of things. Now, huge numbers of benefits here. First of all, the name of this shortcut is very descriptive. I don't necessarily need to have this comment here because it says it in the name of the shortcut. So immediately by just having something well named, I'm able to remove the need for a comment. And this is if you've spotted this very similar to our use of explicit variables, where you can have a named thing that named thing proves very useful in improving the readability and improving the maintainability of your shortcuts. But notice also that I have to actually base 64 encode a whole bunch of things. Um, so if you see this here and this here, I'm in base 64 encoding two images. And rather than reproduce the set of actions here that does that and then reproduce it here as well, I'm able to just call this shortcut twice. So we get that degree of reusability both within one shortcut. And if I need to build another shortcut that has to do the same kind of thing, the same kind of encoding, then I can just reuse this logic without having to copy the actions over. Then if there's a bug in how this works, I can change it in one place. I can come to my base64 encoding thing here, and I can change it in one place. And originally I did have a bug here. I'd missed out this action and it didn't always work. So I was able to just change it in one place by adding this in, and then all of my shortcuts that use this action were fixed just by one change. So I must caution here that this whole approach of breaking shortcuts down isn't without its issues. It's not super well supported in shortcuts. In particular, if you plan to share a shortcut via something like Routine Hub or with some friends, then 
you'll need to also share all of the dependent shortcuts. So by this, I mean, it would be very hard for me to share this PDF Maker Sunday shortcut because I'd need to share this one, this one, I'd need to share this one, I'd need to share every shortcut that this one depends on. I'm hopeful that in a future version of, uh, of shortcuts, Apple will provide a way to package these all up in one go that you can share or provide an easier way of sharing things that are decomposed this way. But for now, that's perhaps the biggest limitation of the decompose method. And you'll often see if you go to a site like Routine Hub where they're sharing big shortcuts, what they actually have is just like 100, 200, 800 actions and lots and lots of comments to get around the fact that they're not able to use these well-named entities uh, that they've refactored out. So one of my other recommendations that I think makes a lot of sense in the shortcuts world in particular and follows on from this whole topic of being able to improve reusability is to make your shortcuts as flexible as possible in the input that they accept. Now, the reason for this is what you don't want to do is end up with three or four shortcuts that all look the same just differ by the input they accept. And let me show you what I mean. So here I've got a, a shortcut that watermarks an image. And basically what I've done is structure it so that if the shortcut input is empty, then it will prompt for the photograph to watermark. Otherwise what it will do is it will use the photo that was passed in. This means two things. I can run it here and I can choose an image directly here and I can watermark that image. Or what I can do is in the Photos app, I can pick an image, open up the share sheet, and then if I scroll down, we'll see that the watermark image is here as a shortcut. And I don't then get prompted when it gets run. It just watermarks and away we go. Now, the way I've done this is really simple. This is a shortcut that accepts some input. And ideally, maybe I could make it accept more than images. Maybe I could make it accept URLs of images and pull those URLs down. You can kind of run this to your heart's content. The general principle, though, is to accept as much as possible. And if the shortcut input is empty, so that means it does not have a value, then I've got some kind of way of getting a default value here. In this case, just select some photographs from the user interface, otherwise use what was passed in. This same pattern is really useful when you're debugging these shortcuts as well. Because if you imagine, if I didn't have this here, and I, it was just uh, whatever photo was passed in from the share sheet, every time I wanted to test this, I'd have to switch back to photos, pick a photo, open the share sheet, blah, 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 blah. It would take ages. As it is, I can just press play here. Now, interesting thing, we've combined this with the always use an explicit variable option. So what I can do during debug is maybe even delete this and choose find photos which will automatically find without prompting me. Tweak that to be that and limit that to just one. And I automatically get a photograph now when I press play and I don't need to be prompting or whatever like that. Everything runs just fine, which is really, really nice. And this is a little handy tip you can get by combining these two options of using an explicit variable and having multiple ways of providing input to the shortcut. Okay, last but definitely not least is a really important topic that I definitely apply in my programming work and I would like to apply in my shortcuts work a lot more, which is to be very delicate with how we affect the broader environment. And what I mean by that is don't just go willy-nilly writing files and photographs and everything all over the device that the shortcut is running on. Think about this in context. How many times have you installed a piece of software on your laptop, on your iPad or wherever, and when you come to clean it up, you come to uninstall it, it's just left files everywhere and getting rid of it, getting rid of all trace of it is really, really hard. One way you can deal with this in the shortcuts world is to provide a way for users to choose where the output is sent to rather than just pre-assuming where you want to do that. So let me show you an example. We've got the bulk resize shortcut here again, and I've presupposed, if I drop a nothing action in here because we've got a little bug that often crops up, I've presupposed down here that I want to save the output of my, re my resize operation to an album called resized but that album might not exist on the user's uh, device, first of all, which is also an issue, but also they might not want to put it there. They might want to put it somewhere else. So a couple of options. Option one is you can go for ask each time. So you can say, every time the shortcut runs, prompt for the album. And I think that's probably the safest default thing to choose. Now, it's not the nicest user interface though, because when I'm running the bulk resize shortcut, I always want the output to go to the same album. So what I can do is leave that as it is, 
come up to the preferences of the shortcut and set an import question. And we saw this in uh, section five. And I'm going to choose right at the bottom here, the album. And where do we save? You can choose a default if you want. Um, leave that as resize maybe. And there we go. Now, when the shortcut is installed, the user can choose specifically where they want to install things to. So another area where it's really common to ruin the environment is using file actions. So if I bring in an append to file action here, and let's just try and write hello, hello to a file called, I don't know, temp.txt. And let's just run that and see what happens. Now, the fact it's taking some time makes me think this has already gone wrong. And yes, that I wrote hello. That does not like the word hello. The reason is this file already exists in the iCloud drive for shortcuts. So there's a really strange little niggle here that everyone should be aware of. And this is definitely something you need to think of if you're going to share your shortcuts. Every shortcut that runs on the device shares the same folder space in iCloud, which is the shortcuts folder. It's not like apps that have their own isolated storage space. Every shortcut is sharing the same short, uh, folder space, which is the shortcuts folder space. Now, that means it's really possible to overwrite another shortcuts files. So, two concrete recommendations. Recommendation one, do consider using import questions here to maybe allow people to choose... Um, they want to use a Dropbox rather than iCloud or whatever, but also you could consider letting them choose the file path. However, I think the issue with letting someone choose a file path is it's still easy for the user to get it wrong and you don't want to be trampling over somebody else's uh, data. So what I recommend is using some way of scoping the file path so the chance of trampling over somebody else is minimal. So one way of doing this is reverse domain names. If you have a domain name, you can just do like co.techcraft and then temp dot text and then the chance of somebody else using that file name very minimal so when i run this now i get an isolated file which has got the word hello in it which is great um this seems like such a small thing but honestly the number of bugs that people have seen from trampling over somebody else's application data or having their own data trampled over by somebody else really quite profound and quite common so uh i definitely recommend paying some attention whenever you're changing storage be it folders be it files be it photos so those are my seven big tips for well-designed shortcuts that are easy to maintain, that are safe to use, safe to share. And they might seem like small things. There's no fancy techniques, there's no fancy algorithms, but really I think a lot of good programming is about robustness, about maintainability, about being explicit about what the program does and how it does that. And over time, I think as you get more and more sophisticated at programming, you get more and more experienced, you tend to veer away from all the fancy cool algorithms towards the much more predictable, stable, uh, easy to understand stuff. And this is how I approach building shortcuts that I know I'm going to have to look after for months and years. They're going to have to be shared on other devices with other people's shortcuts. Just want to make things as safe as possible, as easy as possible, and as robust as possible. So big thanks to everybody who supported me while doing this series. It's been a really uh, exciting time for me. I've really enjoyed it. I've really relished putting together each uh, episode. I will be continuing the shortcuts content every Sunday for the foreseeable future. And I'm going to pick up now by looking at applications that extend the shortcuts environment, things like Toolbox Pro, Push Cuts, Scriptable, things that really kind of go beyond the basics and actually start to make shortcuts into something approaching a real programming language. I hope you like this video and I hope you found it useful. Please hit like, please hit subscribe. And don't just hit subscribe, but hit the bell as well so that you don't miss out on any future content. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.